Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 610. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is July 14th, 2020. All right, welcome to another show. If you hear a mm in the background, that's the AC. I have the AC running because I'm in a box, an ice box right now, <laughs> in the middle of Arizona at Dead Horse Ranch Park. And I figured out how the horse died. Heat. I'm quite sure the horse just dropped dead because it was so hot. Uh, so our RV is stationed here for a couple days and we're going to uh, mosey on up to Moab and probably stop uh, the Grand Canyon on the way. I'll keep you all posted on Facebook to our travels. George, what you been up to? Well, excitement in our household. Our mm -hmm. daughter's taken a new job, the one who's a nurse. She left the eating disorder clinic where she was working and she has answered the call to the colors from the state of California. She's joined the California Health Corps and to fight the COVID virus. And she has been taken a six month position at San Quentin State Prison as a nurse. Wow. In there, San, uh, COVID has affected, infected a third of the inmates of San Quentin and a third of the staff. And it's one of the epicenters of the pandemic right now in California. And the state health department put out a call for doctors and nurses to volunteer uh, to work at the at the uh, the uh, prison, and Laura thought this would be a fun thing to do. It's sort of like uh, joining up the colors after the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor, but knowing the war will be over in six months. Sure, yeah, so, it's, <laughs> you, so you're she, part of the cleanup crew. <laughs> so, so her mother, my wife, uh, is absolutely petrified. You know. Uh, uh, what if she bumps into Charles Manson? I said, well, he's dead. He's going to uh, <laughs> He's dead. Uh, what about the Hillside Strangler? He's dead, too. Uh, <laughs> oh, my. All the real uh, bad ones are gone, huh? Yeah. Well, Sirhan Sirhan is still there. So the uh, guy who shot uh, JF, uh, okay. uh, Ronald, uh, Robert Kennedy. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, uh, the, the prison, there's the prison hospital system. And then... With the COVID virus, they're moving anyone with COVID who needs to be hospitalized into a warehouse on the on the prison grounds, inside the walls. And Laura says it's like World War II movie of these field hospitals of there are several hundred beds, you know, with like a foot apart from each other, metal beds uh, with the with the men lying in their beds moaning, and the nurses and the doctors walking up and down the wards. So, and that's her job. Sure, Florence so uh, Nightingale. Wow. Yeah, well, it's what she went in. It. Laura is a lot like me in temperament. She enjoys sort of the taking the. She enjoys being noble. How's that? <laughs> uh, and so the uh, the call to serve in one of the most awful places in the United States uh, really was uh, something that appealed to her. Hmm. So we're quite proud of her and hope, hope it will be an exciting six months. Wow, that's good. A um, lot of news happening, uh, not just in the Anglican Church, but uh, uh, there is a new normal forming here in America, George, uh, and certainly around the world. And I think people of our generation are becoming unsettled, a little uncomfortable with what they're seeing uh, happen around them watching their history being torn apart, watching their statues have been taken down, watching um, the structures, and I mean the structures of America that we know kind of be torn asunder, so to speak. And I think uh, uh, I'm talking to people and seeing people who just, they're, they're sick of it. You know, can we, th this perfect storm, and it was the perfect storm. We had a pandemic leading to high unemployment, to a recession, to a depression, race riots, and, you know, bring on, there's no asteroid yet, but bring on the next calamity. And people are really growing tired, and I don't think there's going to be a revolution, but there's just a, who, where is a leader? Where's somebody who's going to stand up for me? Where's somebody who's going to 
uh, take us out of this. There's no Ronald Reagan taking us out of the Cold War. There's no JFK taking us out of uh, um, Russia uh, in Cuba. Where is our leader? I'm going to be politically incorrect and say I disagree very strongly with our leaders in the church and in political politics and society who say that the major issue facing society today is racism. I don't buy that for one minute. For me, in my studies and history and my sense and my going out and working with people, where'd you go, Kevin? I turned the AC off so I could hear you better. Go on. <laughs> The degree of despair I'm seeing in the working class I've never seen in my life before, and I've been a priest working primarily in working class communities mm -hmm. for 25 years. I would liken it to the Soviet Union. Um, the death rate from despair, alcoholism, drug abuse, suicide among whites who are not college educated is, has skyrocketed in the past 10 years. They feel alienated because their country, in other words, the things that they took pride in being part of, let's say they were working at General Motors or they're, in a, you know, or being proud to be an American, proud to be a Redskins fan, proud to be Irish American, proud, proud of the thing, you know, proud of having a family, all proud of all these things. And our society has spent 25 years telling them that all the things that they're proud of are worthless. And now they're being told that they possess white privilege and they've got to uh, make amends for all the ills. And the elites, meanwhile, they look at the elites in our country who are so disconnected from their day-to-day -day lives, they might as well be foreign occupiers. And I just have this very, I think we're going to, be, I think the only thing, I think people are waiting in the white working class waiting to vote in November because they see this time as an extinction event. Mm. They are being driven into extinction by a society and by a culture that is hostile to their interests. And I have to tell you, the Episcopal Church has led the charge. You remember Catherine Jefford Shorey. Oh, I do love that woman. She just provided <laughs> such great copy. We're smart people. We don't have big families. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <remember that>? exactly. <laughs> you know, she said, you know, we're Episcopal, you know, she she was interviewed by one of the secular newspapers. Why don't, why is the Episcopalian church decline? Why are Episcopalians fewer in number? Well, we're better educated. We're smarter. We have fewer children and we're more selective. And, and basically it's, you know, she was telling them that, you know, if you, if you're a working man who has a trade, uh, and you've got six kids and a wife who wants to stay at home at work and take care of the kids, don't be an Episcopalian. Now that, oh, that was fine with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Don't be an Episcopalian. But now, don't be an American. Don't be uh, a Redskins fan. Don't be proud of being a Southerner or a Northerner or this or that. Be embarrassed and hate yourself because you're white. And we, and we look at these kids coming out of college a generation so poorly educated, so ignorant. And we're even seeing it in uh, amongst the clergy. I despair sometimes reading these things on the ACNA uh, Facebook page, chat group, because you've got these younger clergy who are indistinguishable from Episcopal clergy who are so woke, who have bought, who've drunk the Kool-Aid that I'm thinking, AC, I, you know, it's not going to be a safe place in 20 years because I've been down this road before and well, those nuts and kooks, unless they're roped in and said, no, your job is not to tear yes. the New York Times <laughs> op-ed page or, or yeah. teach the 1619 project in your youth group. Your job is to teach the saving news of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Acton is going to go the way of the Episcopal Church. It, Unless they start they, doing something. They need to be very careful. And, and it, uh, I think with the Episcopal Church, you start with a couple of crazy old kooks. Here we have a couple of crazy young kooks in uh, the yeah. ACNA who are causing some trouble on Facebook. And, um, it, you know, you need to watch out for it because it's, it's about to make the press when we start talking about it. And uh, uh, there's nothing better than stopping it before it becomes a problem. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. It, 
and it's not malicious. It's not, mm. you know, evil or anything. It's just, oh, I'll be highly insulting and I apologize in advance. ACNA is put together from scratch mm. and they basically took in some people and who were not well educated or trained, who have no sense of what it means to be an Anglican, has no understanding of theology or history, and they're indistinguishable from the next sort of non-denominational megachurch that is the church of what's happening now. And so the winds, look at look what happened to Campus Crusade for Christ and in InterVarsity. Those ministries have basically collapsed and died because they're they're choking on their own wokeness mm -hmm. and I and I read about uh, these uh, people touting critical race theory and all these initiatives and all these plans to have the ACNA look like America which if you're a white working class male is basically another slap in the face because nobody wants to look like them uh, Show's over, folks, if this, if this is going to continue. <laughs> well, I, I, in my, the ACNA, it's still a, a very minority voice. But Facebook uh, propagates and makes minority voices very loud. Once and upon so, a time, Kevin, it was a minority voice in the Episcopal Spawn Church. Spawn was a minority voice. Right, and what right happened was a minority voice. And, yes. and in the 1960s, mm -hmm. well, at first it started in the 1960s, we wouldn't disciplined Bishop Pike because, you know, deep in his heart, he's a nice old guy. He yes. may be crazy as a little. He's an old cook. Yeah. Then we get into Spong. Yes, Jack may not believe in anything, but, you know, he's one of us and he means well. Then, you know, it just, it's the uh, the thin end of the wedge. The, what's another uh, cliche? The camel's nose. Pan no, the Pandora's box. I think Pandora's you know, box. the writer trial was Pandora's the, box. The when they figured out that there was not going to be any oversight and a bishop can do anything, Pandora's box. Now, it's not, I don't, I don't want to paint a, a, a penny in huge broad strokes. Sure. I was very proud of the ACNA's pushback against the prosperity gospel. Absolutely. Uh, that was uh, one of one of its finest moments, but see the thing is that was not led by the episcopate. That was led by rank and file clergy and parishes saying this cannot stand. And good for the ACNA that it has clergy of integrity who are willing to put their head above the parapet and say, "This will not stand. This is a false gospel that some of my colleagues are teaching, and we have to stop this." Problem was, it should have been the bishops who took that hit and the bishop uh, the bishop should have been leading on that and they didn't and now we're seeing the bishops they're not mouthing these platitudes but they're going along to get along and allowing sort of the crazier elements within their rank and file to drive uh, the agenda for the church yeah. and uh, so we shall be observant reporters and uh, see what happens uh, another crazy please hear, please hear me to say and again I said this is not the character of the ACNA this is not about all the ACNA this is a very noisy but influential minority yeah. that unless somebody lays down the law and say what is the what is the teaching the plain teaching and understanding of Jesus Christ what is the teaching of the church in these matters these people are going to twist it and turn it and you're going to have what I've got to face today in an Episcopal church that is rotten to the core. So let's move on to some international news before my cat jumps on to... Get down. Don't, don't jump on the... We are an RV in renovation right now, so on the dashboard is all the tools for all the stuff I've been trying to fix around here. Um, we had previously tried to record an episode of Anglican Scripted, but the cat knocked the phone connected to the internet off the table. Go on, get out of here. Go. Disconnecting us <laughs> from our show. Yeah, so we're finally back up and running. Yeah, yes? Do you hear that snoring on my side? That's that my, that's one of the dogs underneath my desk right now, <laughs> who is uh, 
being a rector's dog is a rather dusty, dull life for a dog, and so they sleep a good time, do a part of the day. And we have three cats in the RV. And I'll tell you the long story for how that happened in our next episode. Let's move on to some international news. Um, Lambeth is not 2020. It's not 2021. They're pushing out the date to 2022. Now, in my mind, as the first person to call the last Lambeth the last Lambeth, I'm happy by that, but I don't think there's any bad news here. I think it's smart to move it out because nobody knows what's going on. And to plan a Lambeth is not something you do in a month. And so, and, and folks, I, I want to want to basically say Kevin is not engaging in hyperbole. He and I uh, were on the Albert Moeller, who's the, the Baptist guy. He has a radio show, and this yeah. is an, this is uh, 2008, and we both said this is the last Lambeth. Uh, that's you know, it's it's over, folks. You know, uh, send in the clowns. Uh, well, <laughs> they did. Uh, they did. <laughs> they uh, did. <laughs> No, but uh, Justin Welby announced that Lambeth is had been postponed to next year. Now it's going out to 2022, mm-hmm. the uh, which is probably upsetting a large number of Episcopal bishops who are waiting to retire and make Lambeth their swan song. It's a fun little way to end their time. Now they got to hang on for another year, and so we'll see these statements. Oh well, with the COVID virus, I think I'm going to postpone my retirement another year. Yeah, we know why. They, Speaking, well, the, the money wasn't there yeah. in in the quantity they needed. Mm-hmm. Because 2008, they basically did it on credit. And when it was over, the bills weren't paid. And the Church of England church commissioners had to uh, pay the pay the wet, pay the debts. They don't want to do that again. Well, they, uh, also, had the, they also had the blue tent. Yes, the blue tent that they forgot to <laughs> expense. And then the bill arrived in the mail and it was left on quarter of a million desk. dollars. <laughs> yes, they went on maternity leave and the bill was on their desk for nine months. Oh. So Lambeth has, you know, the money was not there. And part of it is it's supposed to be self funding. And many of the uh, churches around the world, because of COVID, you know, Rwanda, we did a little story where their income is down 90% because they live by donations that come in every Sunday and no church for three months, no income. Well, they weren't going anyway, but that is typical for many churches in the developing world. So the money's not there. And second, the uh, Justin Welby's push to uh, get the Global South to basically maneuver GAFCON back into the tent, it didn't go very far. Uh, Welby was at the Munir and Nice concert, uh, Munir and Nice installation as Archbishop of the Province of Alexandria, and one of the behind the scenes. I am told I wasn't there. I am told that part of the conversations where Welby is pushing the "Why can't we all be friends? Unity, unity in Christ, we're all one." And he was sort of met with stony faces from the Gafcon people who were there. I think we'll and. See. And the Global South people didn't volunteer anything. They just, Welby's going on, unity, unity, unity. And the Global South is going, my, what time is it? Is dinner ready? Uh, What's on TV tonight? It's tea Uh, time. (laughs) So maybe if he has two more years, Welby can do something. Now, I've always urged GAFCON to go to Lambeth because they have the numbers just with the Church of Nigeria, so many bishops. They have the numbers, and one of the things that we saw in 98 and 2008 was that there, uh, especially in 98, um, most bishops are corporate men, and they follow the majority. And so if the majority's going one way, they want to be in charge. One of my famous anecdotes, I saw uh, uh, Jay Walker, Bishop of Long Island, uh, notorious in many ways, a firm supporter of the gay agenda, ordained many gay clergy. He was the one with the famous penthouse uh, issue, which we won't go into because this is a family show. Well, the penthouse magazine issue. Um, Walker in the final vote, Lambeth 98, uh, Resolution uh, 110. 110. He voted for it. How do I know that? 
because he was sitting right in front of John Howe, and I was watching John Howe, my bishop, put up his hand. And Jay Walker's hand went up as well. W Walker had voted against every everything, everything, until the final vote, he put up his hand. And mo the majority of American bishops in 98 voted for Lambeth 110, including bishops who had ordained gay and lesbian clergy up to that point. That's just how the crowd works. And I think GAFCON, if it plays it right, can basically reorganize the Anglican world, dethrone the Archbishop of Canterbury as the de facto first among equals, have it elected by the primates at a primates meeting. But if you're not showing up to the game, you're not going to win the game. Well, and I also think now they have a, grand, a brand new relationship with the Global South. It seems really strong. There's a new covenant with the Global South. Um, that they just endorsed, I think that that unity, that true unity, not what will be unity, is going to be a good step forward. And if they want to take that to Lambeth, they would rule. They would say, listen, Archbishop of Canterbury is no longer just the Church of England's Archbishop. We're going to pick our own. It's not first, you know, we'll have our own first among equals. It's very simple. I mean, it, these things are run by Robert's Rules of Orders. Mm -hmm. And you know, the first thing is, do we adopt the agenda as laid out by the Archbishop of Canterbury? No. No. <laughs> we offer this agenda in its place. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and no. guess what happens? Mm -hmm. You get, this is what they did at Lent 98. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, uh, the uh, handlers had laid out what they were supposed to say and do and vote. And they said, no, we're going to do what we're going to do. Well, another thing they have to do, remember the uh, the primates not meeting, gathering, they had all the perfect, um, get the cat out of the garbage, please. Thank you. Go on. So if people remember the primates gathering uh, a couple years ago, they got Welby to agree to everything. They got the Episcopal Church to agree to be under super secret probation for three years. The problem is when they said, who's going to enforce this? Welby said, I'll do it. I'll take care of it. I got you covered. And you guys don't have to stay for the final <laughs> oh, press conference. Got you covered. Let me do all the talking. Yeah. That does, yeah. That, no. That, that, that was not a good what, idea. Once you kick them out, you take control. You handle the press conferences. You handle um, the reproachments, you handle everything else after that. Don't leave it back to the Church of England or the Archbishop's office or the ACC, please. Oh my God. So let's talk about the last, uh, we, we haven't even talked about Bishop Lawrence. We need to really get going. What we got here? We're at 22 minutes, George. Two minutes for Bishop Lawrence. We'll give him five. One of my favorite bishops. Bishop Lawrence has called for a coadjutor. Let's quickly talk about the different types of bishops. There's a suffragan coadjutor. This kind of means he wants to retire, not right away, but sooner than later. Right, George? Yes. I, I, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. uh, a coadjutor in the ACNA uh, serves alongside a diocesan and has the right of succession. And I think it can only be up to a year. I'm not certain as to the time frame. So when you call for a coadjutor, that means you're calling for your successor to be elected. Sure. And in that interim period, the bishop is still the bishop. The, co the joke is uh, every morning the uh, coadjutor comes to office and says, how do you feel today, Bishop Lawrence? <laughs> and he really wants to know uh, because if he's not feeling too good, he takes over. So the South Carolina is going through, going to go through a transition. And it's probably a good time because the, it looks like they've won their property issues. Bishop Lawrence has shepherded them, as did Bishop Iker, through the major battles. At, yes, it'll go to the Court of Appeals. Yes, it'll go to the Supreme Court. But at this stage, as Alan uh, Haley has said, you know, it's basically been set. The, uh, the, the legal uh, tracks have been laid down. Mm -hmm. And unless we have another around a funny business with a crooked judge, which we had last time, it's pretty much they've won. The Anglican Diocese has won. So it's a good time for Bishop Lawrence to begin the transition out if he's he has to retire at a certain age. Sure. But it's a good time to step away and to allow his successor to come in in a new era, one not uh, marked by 
the, the constant threat of litigation, but allowing the diocese to turn its energies and its income back into building the church uh, and the uh, faith of its people. Absolutely. I mean, it's one of those things that we saw him come to office and he, he had to be elected twice. Right? Don't you remember this because the first time he got elected, he was rejected by Catherine Jefford Shore, who said, or it, it wasn't just her, it's who, who's in charge of the oversight of the bishops? Um, some board. Well, she she's the president of a, uh, she presides at the House of Bishops meeting right. and Bishop Lawrence did not get the necessary number of consents. Right. And so that re that means he was rejected. Mm -hmm. Well, South Carolina held a second election, elected him again. Mm -hmm. And he was basically at, asked, will you take the Epis diocese out of the Episcopal Church? And they put all sorts of constraints on him. And he said, no, I have no intention or plans to do so. And actually, he didn't. He uh, did he, was he, had to be, he had to be forced church. out. I mean, I, he went out kicking and screaming. I mean, it just... He, you know, Bishop Bishop Lawrence uh, was kicked out of the Episcopal Church. He did not violate the pledge that he made when he to the uh, Episcopal Church. The Episcopal Church violated its faith with him. Yeah. So it's been a it must be a very wearing position Bishop Lawrence has been in. Uh, certainly, it's not what he signed up for, but he's been faithful throughout the fight. Yeah, well, he he fought the the fight well, and uh, maybe I can have an exit interview with him when he's when he's all done. Um, I wanted to talk about the Hong Kong Archbishop uh, story. Let's save that for Friday. Um, all right. It's the, the the cabin here is heated up because I turned the AC off. Uh, I have uh, uh, two people behind me working full time at the at their desk, and they're getting warm. So I'm going to turn that back on as soon as we sign off. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and you've been listening to episode 610. 600? Yep, yeah, you're doing 610. it. 610. Imagine that. Of Anglican Unscripted.